What is minerality when it comes to wine? Is it a taste, a feeling, or some bogus concept meant to keep wine mysterious? What's the latest with the devastating wildfires in Sonoma wine country, and how will that impact the wines we drink? Why are winemakers wary of cannabis producers? It's not what you might think. And what is a new wine group doing to help with a balanced life? That's exactly what we'll be learning on today's episode of the Unreserved Wine Talk podcast. Do you have a thirst to learn about wine? Do you love stories about wonderfully obsessive people, hauntingly beautiful places, and amusingly awkward social situations? Well, that's the blend here on the Unreserved Wine Talk podcast. I'm your host, Natalie McLean, and each week I share with you unfiltered conversations with celebrities in the wine world, as well as confessions from my own tipsy journey as I write my third book on this subject. I'm so glad you're here. Now pass me that bottle, please, and let's get started. Welcome to episode 54. Miles and I are working our way through the entire series of the television show, Justified. It's about a U.S. Marshal in Kentucky and all the odd, 'er ne'er-do-well characters he has to chase down in a good-natured way. We're on season six, and it is so good. Someone help me. (laughs) It's as addictive as those chocolate-covered almonds. Did you ever get caught up in a show that you just wanted to binge watch all weekend? Well, that's what one of my new students told me a couple of days ago about the Wine Smart course, and that, oh my gosh, made my week. I just relaunched this new course, and I poured everything into it. Yes, the puns intended. It's a full-bodied framework to help you taste, pair, and buy wine like a pro. Now, in the main audio of this podcast, I say that I will be relaunching it, and that's because this is from a Facebook Live video I did a few weeks ago. But it's here now! But wait, there's more. You can find out more about this new in-depth course during my new free online class, The Five Wine and Food Pairing Mistakes That Can Ruin Your Dinner and How to Fix Them Forever. Just go to nataliemcclain.com forward slash class to pick your class time and then you and I are going to taste some wine together. Yay, tis the season, right? It's a great time to take some time for yourself during the holidays and relax with a glass of wine, or three, and me. (laughs) Now on another note about the main audio, I talk about the Sonoma wildfires as still not under containment, but fortunately, thank goodness, they now are. However, the impact on wine country was substantial, so we're going to talk about that and what it means for the wines we'll be buying and tasting in the future. I'll also include links to the articles I mentioned, my latest wine reviews, and the video version of this discussion, plus the link so that you can sign up for my free wine class about those five absolutely devastating pairing mistakes in the show notes at nataliemclean.com forward slash 54. All right, let's dive into our topics today. Where we're going to start is, what's the latest on the Sonoma wildfires? I'm going to take a sip of my Bordeaux. We were tasting Bordeaux in my private Facebook group tonight for students only. Found some really great bargain price Bordeaux. I know that seems like an oxymoron, but it is possible. The one I like best is $16. And my course students know which one it is. Tease, tease, tease. (laughs) So in the next week or so, I'm going to relaunch my course so you can join it. But to do that, I'm going to have a free wine class that you can listen in on, whether you buy the course or not. And thanks to your feedback, I'm calling it the five wine and food pairing mistakes that can ruin your dinner and how to fix them forever. So that's the title of the free class. And at the end of that, after I teach you and give you lots of good juicy tips, 
and feedback. I'm going to tell you about the course, which is the Wine Smart course, a full bodied framework to taste, pair, and buy wine like a pro. And you're going to love it. I know you are. All right, guys, let's talk about those wildfires. It just seems so devastating, especially the Kincaid fire that has broken out this week. You know, it was 2017 and we were talking about these wines. The red wines are now hitting the shelves of the 2017 vintage. And here we are again. So let me give you the details that I have researched and gathered. The damage in Sonoma, Napa from the Kincaid fire is roughly so far 74,000 acres since it started a week ago last Wednesday. But this is mostly in wooded areas and mountains not so much in the grapevines and wineries. Now, that's not to say the wineries have been given a pass. They haven't. But the majority of the fires, from what I'm reading, have occurred in secluded areas. 30% containment as of Wednesday, October 30th, and it could take weeks to extinguish. That is just really darn scary. But here's some interesting things, and I'm reading from a CBS television report website. Grapes don't burn. Obviously, you know, I don't know if you watched that one with Kino Reeves, that movie. What was it called? A Walk in Something. And they throw a fire out to the vineyards and the leaves are green. The grapes are green. (laughs) All this vegetation is green. It's not going to light on fire. But here's the thing. For the grapes right now in Sonoma, 95% of them were harvested by the third week of September, according to Michael Henney, executive director of the Sonoma County Vintners. So they're in tanks and well protected. So that's kind of good. However, here's the devastations. 185,000 people in Sonoma have been evacuated. There are two wineries that have had significant destruction, Fieldstone Winery and Soda Rock Winery. So let me compare this to the October 2017 Tubbs Fire in California. It killed 22 people and destroyed the Paradise Ridge Winery in Santa Rosa. So let's put this in context. About 80% of U.S. wine comes from California. It's the fourth largest producer of wine in the world. Sales of $40 billion. $1.5 $1.5 billion in exports, and this wine generates another $7.2 billion in California tourism. People come to visit the wineries. So why are these wildfires happening now? Well, some, of course, argue climate change, and I would tend to put myself in that camp. What is that? It's a combination of parched vegetation, high winds, and low humidity. According to CBS, since the 1970s, California wildfires have increased five-fold. That is just astounding. Over the past decade, the average temperatures have risen two degrees Fahrenheit. But here's what's happened at the same time. There's been a moisture deficit. So what is that? It's the difference between the amount of water that's actually in the atmosphere and the amount of water it can hold. And so that has not sort of caught up with the increase in average temperature. So what does that mean? Lower relative humidity causes brush vegetation to dry out faster. And that just creates kindling to burn where the fire starts, according to CBS. Plus, you get wind gusts of 70 miles per hour. And what they're saying is that the wine country wildfires They can see those from San Francisco. This is like an hour, hour and a half drive from Sonoma, Napa. They've had minimal rain for the last five months. Again, that's just fuel on this kindling. I just find that fascinating and devastating at the same time that these things are going on. You know, the whole thing about wine is that you have to surrender Wine is an agricultural product so dependent on Mother Nature. I used to work in Procter & Gamble, P&G, as a brand manager. So think Pringles, Duncan Hines, Crisco, lots of food products. Those were uniform. The control variable was high. 
And then here I am in wine where it just seems out of your control. You have to deal with what mother nature gives you, not just, oh, we had low rains or we had an early spring frost, but these wildfires, it makes you think I am not in control. The only thing I can control is how I respond and react, which is a good metaphor for life and any sort of emotional crisis. And yet here we are safe and sound, not in those wildfires. So what can we do? Let me give you a few suggestions if you're thinking like, oh God, I see these pictures on the news about these fires. What can I do? First, open a bottle or three of Sonoma wine. Support them. Buy Sonoma wine. Make a conscious effort. Share it with others and tell them why you're opening this bottle. And it's not just because they're going through a tough time. This is great wine. One of my favorites, La Crema Pinot Noir from Sonoma. Love that wine. Going to buy a case this weekend. What else can we do? There are fundraising campaigns going on right now. You can Google that to find various fundraising campaigns. Look into those and participate for sure. Also, don't cancel plans to visit wine country. So what happens when we hear about these wildfires is that everybody goes, oh, better not go. But often the fires are not attacking right where you want to go. You're not going to be coughing from smoke. It's often just remotely located. And yet they desperately need you to still go to wine country because that is what supports wine sales, all the wine jobs, all the spin-off jobs for restaurants. So don't cancel your plans and actually make plans to go. Some people say, oh, they're having a tough enough time. I don't want to overburden them. Not the case. They want and welcome you. So that's that topic. My second topic is cannabis and wine. So here's the thing. Cannabis, of course, is legal throughout Canada. Yay. And I say yay because I've come around to that. I thought, oh, why do we need to do this? But I've really read up on the issue. It's not just a matter of taking something off a black market that is truly not harmful in moderation and making more tax dollars and whatever, but it's about freedom of choice as well. And I think that we can make intelligent decisions about cannabis just as we do wine. So now cannabis is also, as you all know, legal in about 30 states, either medically and or recreationally. Here's the controversy. Cannabis producers would like to use or starting to use wine appellations on their packaging. So Napa Valley Cannabis or Napa Valley CBD or THC, which are the two psychoactive ingredients. Here's the argument. It is an agricultural product or plant that is based very much on place, just like wine is, or grapevines. However, winemakers are really seriously against this because they built up brand names like Napa Valley and Sonoma and Niagara and the Okanagan and many others, in relation to wine and not any other agricultural product. In fact, often it's a protected trademark. So what are we to do about that? The other thing that cannabis producers are doing, of course, is creating de-alcoholized wines with cannabis, and they're launching in the U.S. this fall. So let me clarify this product begins as a wine with alcohol that's removed, so it's de-alcoholized, and then the cannabis is added. And traditionally, de-alcoholized wines are, I find, neutered of their aroma and taste. However, these wines with cannabis added are a different animal. There's two methods to add cannabis, infusion or emulsion. Infusion means that the cannabis plant is steeped in the wine as if you're making tea. Whereas emulsions, the cannabis is an oil-based, water-soluble liquid that blends in with the wine and is more easily mixed together with it. And in fact, there's nano emulsion technology that creates minuscule drops of cannabis oil so that it doesn't separate out from the wine. And of course, 
A lot of people are looking at micro dosages these days. So instead of looking at the alcohol level on your label of wine, you might be looking for CBD or THC levels. Absorption, of course, of CBD or THC varies by person and format. So smoking cannabis, for instance, has an immediate impact. Under the tongue sprays, sublingua, 15 to 30 minutes before you feel the effect. Edibles, one to two hours. Liquids, about an hour. Some that are marketing these wines, they're saying they're giving a body high and a head high that is highly bioavailable. And that's where the absorption varies by person comes into play. We all have receptors that vary by person, by biology, of how much of this CBD or THC we absorb and how fast, which I find fascinating, actually. But here's more controversy. Can these de-alcoholized wines even use the word wine? Because federally in the U.S., cannabis is not legal. It's only state by state that have granted legality. Each one of them have different labeling requirements. So that makes it extra tricky, I would say. California winery owner Francis Ford Coppola, also a movie director, by the way, produces cannabis products under the label Santa. There has been a weed and wine symposium for three years, highly popular in Santa Rosa, California. And in Toronto, Alana Bernstein, who operates the company Viv and Oak, has launched an alcohol-free sparkling rosé of Merlot and Grenache with 25 milligrams each of CBD and THC offered at $38 retail set to debut in September. I need to get a hold of her. (laughs) I want to try this. By the way, coming up in a couple weeks, Jamie Evans, who is a herb sommelier. So she combines wine and cannabis. She's out of California. I know you'll love that talk. So we've covered California wine fires cannabis, and now we're going to go on to minerality. We're not going to get super technical. I'm going to give you some great tips from an article I read this week. But man, this term gets batted around so much. I just wanted to deal with it up front. You know, I just discovered the website daily750.com. I think it's for the wine industry, but I'm finding the articles are really well-researched and written. I'm going to include a link to the article in the show notes. So let me uh, summarize what they're saying about minerality. Often soil types are listed in a tasting note for a wine, or maybe even on the back of a bottle label. So you'll see schist and clay and loam and all kinds, limestone, of course, all kinds of different types of soils. What does that mean? Does it really have any relevance for the wine? And even some wines are named for their soils. So there's wineries like Chalk Hill, Terra Rossa, Magma. Something must be going on, right? But really, is it? Here's what the daily.750.com article says. A small amount of material from the soil is drawn up through the grapevine's roots and deposited in the fruit and its juice where it lingers through vinification. The popular notion is that, say, molecules of flint and chalk can be tasted when we drink these wines, a literal expression of place carried straight through to our taste buds. Not so, my friends. As the article continues, it quotes geologist Alex Maltman from his book, it's not possible for us to taste minerals from the soil when we drink wine. The roots only absorb water, and any substances that make it into the plant have to be dissolved in water to be nutrients for the plants. Most of the mineral nutrients taken in by vines come from what he calls hummus. It's not the takeout or the (laughs) hummus that you might get. Maybe it's pronounced humus. Anyway, not what we want to eat with takeout, but it's the decayed biological matter that 
comprises about 4% of vineyard soil. And of course, this can be supplemented with fertilizer. Maltman writes, as water enters vine roots, it encounters a series of chemical gradients, et cetera, et cetera, biological screens that select which of the dissolved ions can pass through and be transported into the vines. And he further says geological materials, rocks, are mostly tasteless and odorless. So what are we doing when we're saying wine is or has great minerality? So Michael Tordiff, the article goes on to say, of the Mondale Chemical Census Center in Philadelphia, says people can taste minerals that are biologically relevant, like sodium, you know, salt, calcium, magnesium, zinc. But the flavor of wine is so complex. Can some of the minerals that we're actually discussing be perceived? I wrote about this in my book, but Randall Graham, who I love, a winemaker and founder of Bonnie Dune Vineyard in California, actually put rocks into wine in the barrel as it was fermenting. (laughs) And it was not a great experiment, but at least it was worthwhile knowing. And the, uh, what is it, the FDA, the Federal Bureau of Alcohol and Firearms, such an odd mix, came to him and prevented him from doing further experiments because I think some arsenic was starting to emerge, not that he intended that. But what Graham said, his experiments were, quote, disastrous but that there was an exposure to minerals that created the sensation of minerality. So I think minerality is often a feeling more than a taste. I don't know if it's like those lickamade things we used to get as kids that would explode and pop on our tongues when we're young, you know, little explosive little flavors, but I think it's more a feeling than a taste. Back to Maltman, the geologist who says geology can influence wine, but it's more in the way that a particular soil composition drains. The vine roots have to fight harder, or how it retains or reflects the sun's heat. That's more relevant. If you've had a sip of salt water, you've had a good idea what minerality is like. And that's what Maltman is saying. We can pick up sodium. It really has a taste. But when you get beyond that for other minerals, they're less taste observant, if you will. Acidity plays a major part. Acidity, I think, and minerality have often been confused. So saline or saline, acertico, the white grape from Greece, is a great example. It's not actually minerals. It's an illusion, sensation of chalk and minerals and salt. But that does not mean it's actually minerals because the grapes absorb water, not minerals. To summarize on minerality, there are three definitions of minerality. Minerality can mean the actual geological minerals that make up the rocks in the ground, according to this 750 article. Two. It can refer to nutrient minerals that the plant tries to absorb, like potassium. Or three, a flavor descriptor. But that's where we get lost or confused. As a flavor descriptor, when you say this wine has great minerality, is it a smell? Is it a taste? Is it a mouthfeel? Is it an acidity? Is it aroma or is it some elusive combination of all of it? That's what I would say, an elusive combination of all of it. Let's just compare for a moment. We can say that a wine smells like ripe cherries. Does that mean cherries were added to the wine? No, of course not. What that means in my mind is that the wine mimics the aromas of cherries. And how does it do that? Because wine is the ultimate chameleon fruit. I like that quote. I need to write it down. It can molecularly mimic the structures that give off the aromas of cherries in cherries themselves, but in the wine. So we think 
Wow, this smells like cherries. Did they crush cherries into this wine? No, they did not. But this chameleon wine is giving off cherries. So I think it can do the same for minerality and in turn, stone, flint, clay, loam, limestone, whatever you have there. That's my conclusion. And also, no cherries were harmed in the making of this broadcast. All right, a little taste of my Bordeaux, and then on to our fourth and final topic. Elaine, my core student, um, I'm tasting that pirouette, and it is really coming into its own now that it's been three hours decanted. Bordeaux, 24 bucks. You cannot beat that. I will be posting this link in the show notes for the podcast, but it's abalancedglass.com. So this is a site that is for people who work in the wine industry, but I think that for those of us who love wine, who drink wine frequently, regularly, I think all of us have an interest in how to balance our love of wine with a healthy lifestyle. And I love the approach of this website. It is designed for wine growers, vintners, wine retailers, sommeliers, writers, but I just think it has a relevance for a broader audience who loves wine and drinks wine regularly and wants to know, am I keeping it all in check? Is my consumption balanced? Am I living a full life? Because to me, a full life includes the pleasure of wine, but also not overindulging. And I am a moth to a flame, as I have expressed in the past, to be full surface here. My father was an alcoholic. My mother and grandmother were teachers. So I know the power of knowledge from my mother and grandmother and the power of indiscriminate use of something. So that's why I'm always surfacing health studies. I am like, got my antenna up all the time for what is the latest scientific research telling us? How can we live a balanced and healthy life with wine as part of it? This to me is very interesting. The objective of this site is for people to say, hey, I love wine. I either work in the wine industry or I love wine as a regular part of my life. So how do I keep that in balance? Abalancedglass.com. I encourage you to check it out. You know, when abstinence is not a priority or realistic, I can't stop tasting wine and yet I want to live a healthy life. So what do I do? And I love the tips that they have in this post. They were interesting interviewed by Food and Wine Magazine in the United States, not to be confused with Food and Drink by LCBO. They have a weekly email that will give you tips on balancing your consumption. And it's not a scold. It's not a stop now or you'll ruin your family. They're really good, really good tips. So let me just share with you a few things. First of all, Tip one, be honest with where you are with your consumption. Everyone's different, and there's no judgment. We all know that men and women have different moderation guides. I've heard one to two to three glasses of wine for women, two to four glasses for men. But we just need to come to grips with where we want to be in life and how we want to enjoy life and how we want to wake up in the morning. Their tip two, change one thing. Here's a neat thing, and it's not about getting all wine police with where you're at, but I love this tip. Count the glasses you drink. For example, decant a half a bottle so you don't drink the whole thing. Put the glass down between sips. Drink one or two glasses of wine to every glass of water. I love that. Simple things. Because I think as with wine, so with food, we can mindlessly eat. We can go through a whole bag, a large bag of potato chips while watching TV. When you're mindful 
that's where the change comes with anything, not just food and wine, but all kinds of things in our lives. Get connected. There's lots of groups who promote or who support moderation and abstinence, if that's the way you want to go, abstinence, but moderation. And you want to seek out that kind of support. Here's what I love. Breathe. Breath work. And if you haven't heard of this, get turned on to it. Whether you go for an app like Calm, I've got no affiliation with them, or just deep breathing, deep belly breaths, that tells you to relax. The predator is gone. The race is run. You can relax. We've got primal urges to protect, to run, to be fearful. We descend from a long line of people who stayed alive in the jungle, and we don't need to do that anymore. We just breathe. Big, deep belly breaths, just four to five of them. You will change your physiology and your mindset. All right. Love it. Bye for now. Take care. Well, there you have it. You'll find links to the articles I mentioned, my latest reviews, the video version of this discussion, and that link so that you can sign up for my new free wine class about those five devastating pairing mistakes that you want to avoid, especially over the holidays, in the show notes at nataliemclean.com forward slash 54. So what was your favorite tip or quote from this episode? Please share that with me on Twitter or Facebook and tag me at Natalie McLean. On Instagram, I'm at Natalie McLean Wine. If you like this episode, please tell a friend about it, especially one who's interested in learning about minerality and wine or who wants to get in on that free pairing class. My podcast is easy to find whether you search Google on its name, on Reserve Wine Talk, or on my name. I can't wait to share more wine stories with you next week. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this one. I hope something great is in your glass this week, perhaps a terrific mineral-rich wine, as we share a wine glass together. You don't want to miss one juicy episode of this podcast, especially the secret full-bodied bonus episodes that I don't announce on social media. So subscribe for free now at nataliemclean.com forward slash subscribe. Meet me here next week. Cheers. Cheers.